My name is James Thomas, and I'm a, uh, I'm a software engineer, and I work in IBM's Emerging Technologies Division. And I'm also, right, I'm also a huge fan of JavaScript. It's my, it's my favorite programming language. I love to code in it wherever possible. Um, at work, generally, I think whatever the problem, JavaScript is the solution. And I consider myself today a kind of full stack JavaScript engineer, right? Front end, back ends, you know, I use JavaScript for everything. And I think as a language, JavaScript has been kind of taking over the world for the past kind of two decades. Right? It started as purely a front-end language for building kind of client-side web apps. And then Node.js came along, and now you could build your back-end APIs and services in the same language. And now people are even today doing things like uh, building native mobile apps using the JavaScript toolkit and language. Now, working in IBM's Emerging Technologies Division, uh, another area that I'm really interested in is IoT, right, the Internet of Things. The idea that we have all of these connected smart devices in our home, in our work or our office that we can hack around with and got open APIs and build some kind of really interesting stuff. But for many of us, I think, for kind of front-end developers or high-level developers, you might not necessarily think that you have the skills to play with IoT devices. You might think it, it's kind of all very low-level and hardware hacking. You need to dust off your soldering iron and learn embedded C. But I wanted to see if I could combine my two areas of interest, right, JavaScript and IoT, and actually build solutions using JavaScript as the glue. And I was actually really, when I started to kind of look into this online, I was really happy to find out that actually you can do this, right? There's loads of open source libraries and toolkits and frameworks that make this really, really easy to do. And so I'm going to introduce you today to a really popular open source tool called Node-RED that allows you to build your own internet of JavaScript-enabled things. Now, before I, I, I go into the demo, I'm going to spend most of this talk doing a live demo with some devices I brought along and Node-RED. I want to kind of just step back uh, and kind of think about, you know, what do I mean when I talk about the Internet of Things, right, and why do I think it's so interesting? I think often when you hear people talk about IoT in the media or online or on social channels, it's always in such a, an abstract or nebulous sense, right? It's always about, they say things like, it's all about connected homes, or, you know, it's about smart devices, intelligent transport. And they'll give you, I think, some really kind of practical examples of how IoT is transforming everyone's lives. And I think a really simple but powerful example of IoT actually comes from the home. And it's in the evolution of a device that we all know called uh, the thermostat. So this is a thermostat. I'm sure you all recognize it. I'm sure there's some in this building. You probably have one at home. Uh, and this is called uh, the kind of core invention behind the modern day thermostat is something called the mercury tilt switch. And it was actually invented uh, in the 1830s in Scotland by a chemi chemist called Andrew Ewer. Uh, and for the next 200 years, right, the thermostat didn't really change. You know, it's a, it has a little dial, you can change the temperature and the switch open and closes as the temperature changes, right? If we were in Silicon Valley, they would say there was not a lot of innovation in the thermostat space. Uh, and that was until 2011, right, when a company called Nest came along and launched the first intelligent kind of consumer thermostat, right? This was a thermostat which had its own operating system. It ran Linux under the covers on the device. It had Wi-Fi connectivity, so it meant that I could have a mobile app to interact with my thermostat wherever I was within the world. It could talk to other devices in the home. So, for example, it could talk to your air conditioner and uh, your boiler and try and make most energy efficient usage of, of electricity in your home. And it was supposed to be intelligent because it was supposed to be able to understand your patterns of use and set the temperature automatically using machine learning. So it knows in the winter, you come home early, you turn the temperature up at half past six every day, and it could do that automatically, again, using kind of machine learning under the covers. Uh, and this is an example of IoT in the home, but it's a major revolution for what had previously been a very kind of dumb, simple mechanical device, a very physical thing. And now it's got its own embedded Linux system, it's got machine learning, it's intelligent. So IoT as a kind of area has, I think, has exploded over the past 10 years, right? In 2008, we passed this threshold where the number of devices connected to the internet uh, is more than the number of people. And it's estimated by 2020, there's going to be 50 billion of these devices online. That's seven for every person within the world. And if you look at the, the kind of IoT space, one of the things you'll soon realize is that it's just really, really busy. 
So this is a chart that gets put together every year by a venture capitalist firm where they're trying to categorize all of the you know, providers and manufacturers and technologies in the IoT space, right? You can see there's, there's hundreds of different logos crammed on there. And what I personally find so exciting about IoT is that a lot of these devices that are being produced are very kind of off-the-shelf consumer commodity products. So they're, they're easy to get hold of and they're generally under $100. But most of them also have um, APIs, or they have SDKs, or they build on open platforms, which means you can actually hack on them. So you can take some of these off-the-shelf products with sensors and machine learning and connect them together with a little bit of glue code and build your own kind of connected homes using very, very commodity products. But if you've got some of these uh, IoT devices in your home, maybe you've got things like the Amazon Echo or the Philips Hue light bulb or something like a Raspberry Pi, you might not think that you have the skills to be able to play in this space. You think it's, it's all soldering irons and embedded C and hexadecimal over a serial port. Uh, and I'm, I'm very dangerous with the soldering iron, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. Uh, and I was kind of thinking, you know, could I, could I build my own kind of internet of JavaScript enabled things, right? Is this possible? Is it practical? And how would I do this? Well, like any JavaScript developer today, right, I'm overly reliant on its ecosystem to do anything, right? I can't really do anything without going to NPM and installing a module. And I think this is one of the strengths of JavaScript as a language, is the size of its ecosystem, right? There's over a quarter of a million modules in NPM now for doing everything with the language. So if you go to NPM and you start to look for some of the devices that are kind of off-the-shelf products, you know, I was surprised to find that actually for things like the Raspberry Pi, which is this $25 Linux machine on a credit card, there were 635 modules. You know, the Arduino, which is a very popular open source electronic prototyping platform, 400. And again, generally tagged with IoT, there's something like close to 1,000 modules. So people have already been experimenting in this space, right? Taking the low-level device drives and APIs, wrapping them in a nice little JavaScript interface, and then publishing them on NPM. So you, if you have one of those Nest thermostats in your home, right, using a tiny little bit of JavaScript, you can actually NPM install the module, you know, authenticate, and then write a call a JavaScript function to get the current and target temperature, right? So now we can start to, to play around with these devices using JavaScript as the code. But if you've got some of these devices, right, and you found the NPM modules to kind of connect to them and talk to them, and you start to kind of build your own IoT solutions in the home, you'll kind of realize that developing a kind of IoT applications, you go through a kind of as the same pattern every time, I feel. You start off with some of these, these random devices, and at first you just want to get connected to them, right? Can I connect to them with some code? Can I read some data off? What sensors have they got? What commands can I send it? Uh, and then you want to, when you've got connected to your devices, you generally want to connect them together. So, you're, okay, I want to connect my, you know, my Raspberry Pi to my Amazon Echo Dot or something like that. Uh, and you end up building this, this kind of same architecture. It's all event-driven messes passing, right? When some data comes from this device, send a command to this device. And then when you've, you've connected your devices together with this kind of message passing architecture, the next thing people want to do is connect their devices to the internet. Maybe you want to put your, you know, your fridge on Twitter. You want to have a Slack bot to be able to control devices in your home. Or maybe you want to call some kind of REST-based APIs. And I think you, if you've done this a couple of times, just, you start to wonder, right, is there, a, is there a way to speed up development in the IoT space with JavaScript if, I'm, you know, if I spend all this time experimenting, building the same architectures, uh, and then kind of connecting things to the internet? You know, what, if, what if you had a tool that allowed you to do really quick visual prototyping so you didn't have to know the intricacies of how you connect to the 10th the device that I've got in my home? You know, if we're going to build the same architecture, it's event-driven, it's message passing, is there a way to reduce the amount of boilerplate that we write? And also, when I'm building kind of IoT solutions in the home, we're using these very commodity off-the-shelf products like the Echo Dot, the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino. If I've done something cool, how can I share that online so other people can get hold of it? And vice versa, right? Can other people pull in my solutions really, really easily? Well, you might guess the answer to this question, right? If the answer is no, there is no tool, this would be a very short talk, I think. Um, but I came across this really awesome tool I'm going to be sharing with you today, which is open source and um, which is called Node-RED. So let me ask the audience, I can just about see you. Who's, has anyone heard of Node-RED before? Yeah, a couple, a couple of just people. Has anyone used it? Okay, it looks like, so it looks like it's familiar to a few of you. Uh, and Node-RED is an open source Node.js application that kind of builds itself as a, a visual tool for wiring the Internet of Things. And that's what I'm going to be showing you how to, to use shortly and hopefully give you the skills to go and do this yourself at home. 
Uh, and if you install the Node-RED application using NPM, it's an NPM package, uh, and you start up, you get a browser-based editor, which looks a bit like this, where you can drag on your different devices and wire them together and then write little, little bits of code to kind of build up your own solutions. But before I show you it running live on laptop, I want to kind of explain two fundamental concepts, I think, that will make it a little bit easier to understand. So the first concept is that Node-RED has this idea of um, nodes. So nodes are supposed to represent your devices. So they're a little visual widget, which is your abstraction to the device that you want to interact with. And Node-RED has nodes for all different common IoT devices. It has protocols like HTTP and WebSockets. And then it has uh, internet-based services like Twilio or Slack and things like that. And it kind of abstracts all the devices away into this nice little visual widget that you can drag onto the palette and then connect together. And actually, the nodes themselves are just HTML and JavaScript under the covers that's packaged up and installed in a special way. So you can actually write these yourself. But uh, Node-RED is a really, really popular tool and has a huge community of users. So generally, you can just go and install someone else's packages for GitHub for, for any device that you want to interact with. So if you've got your nodes and you kind of drag them onto the main page and start to wire them together, the kind of configuration that you come up with is called the flow, and the flow is kind of like your IoT application. And the cool thing about the flows is, because this is just a Node.js app with a kind of web-based front end, you can actually export that solution as just a JSON document, and then obviously you can really easily share that online on something like GitHub. And it means also then you can import other people's flows really, really easily. A uh, great thing about Node-RED is that it's been around for about four or five years and it's very popular in the IoT community. Um, and it means that uh, there's just a huge community of users who've already published nodes and flows for doing just about everything with a toolkit. So this is a website called the Node-RED Library where people publish what they've been up to. And for any device or flow, you can kind of go and see what people have been doing and install it. But from my perspective, the best thing is that it runs on Node.js. So you get a browser-based front end, but then the back end is running in Node, which means that you can write bits of JavaScript to execute on demand as the messages are traveling between your different devices to kind of implement your business logic. So let's have a look at doing a demo now, right? And I want to kind of show you how to do some sample IoT development using this cool open source project called Node-RED. Now, because this is IoT, right, I obviously need, uh, I need some devices to play with. So I've actually brought two here with me today. Uh, and the first is called the, it's called the TI sensor tag. This is what I've got here in this little rubber case. Uh, and it, what it is basically is a low, low power, low energy uh, electronics board that's packed with loads of different kinds of sensors. So it's got things like an accelerometer, temperature, pressure, humidity, all this kind of stuff uh, packed onto this little electronics board. It has Bluetooth in there as well, so you connect over Bluetooth energy and then you can kind of read all the sensor data. Uh, and it's low power, so it's supposed to run for a single year on a three volt battery, um, which, is, which is pretty impressive. And they're very robust, and people use them in the field for all kinds of different sensor projects. So that's the first device that I've got. Uh, and the second device I've got is the, the Blink one, which is this, which is this programmable LED, which is the thing on the end. I'll just hang it over the side. Um, and it was, a, it was a popular Kickstarter project a couple of years ago to produce a you know, consumer programmable RGB LED. It has a USB interface where you can send it an RGB color code, and then it all, you know, it's a full RGB LED. Again, it was about $20. You can buy them online. The sense tag was about $25. And people, people buy these, these LEDs in like thousands and connect them together and use it for all kind of ambient projects. So imagine that you've just bought these devices online or maybe you've been given them or something like that and you're just kind of, you're interested to see what you can kind of do with them. And you've heard about Node-RED, so we're going to look at uh, using Node-RED to kind of connect them together and kind of hopefully do some kind of interesting stuff. So let me drop out. I'm going to have a quick drink of water. Oh, no, my screen. So this is, um, this is Node-RED website. If you go to, to node-red.org, it gives you the links to how to get started. You can install it locally with NPM. You can install it with Docker. You can push it to a cloud provider, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's got really good documentation and links to the community and, and to GitHub and all those kind of things. But I think for most people, the easiest way to get started is to use the, the NPM package here, which you can install with the, the NPM commands. Uh, and then you get this little uh, command line utility that you can start up the browser-based editor in your local environment. So if I go to my terminal, and I make that a bit bigger, so you can see, there we go, right. Uh, I've already installed Node-RED, so I can, I can hopefully start it up. 
So it's going to start that kind of runtime in the back end, which runs your IoT stuff, uh, and then it's going to start up on your local port, uh, the browser-based editor. So I go back to Chrome now. Uh, and here's the, the kind of Node-RED editor running locally on my laptop. So let's go through, before I jump into playing with the devices, let me show you a kind of hello world example to show you how you kind of wire to nodes together and how they work. So you can see on the left hand side, right, I have all of these, these, these nodes that I've already got installed uh, for kind of interacting with devices and APIs and services. Node-RED comes with tons of them out of the box, but you can just install them from the community from things like GitHub. Uh, and there's kind of three types of node. You have uh, input nodes, so you can see the little, um, the red kind of square on the right hand, the gray square on the right hand side. Uh, and what these do is these talk to a device or a service and they push messages into Node-RED. Um, you have output nodes, which basically will receive messages and then run some command on some device or some service, some API. Uh, and then you have kind of function nodes, which will take a message in, um, do some transformation, and then pass it out as well. So let me, let me show you what they call the hello world example in Node-RED, which is taking two nodes, an input and output node. Uh, you wire them together by dragging a wire from the input node to the output node. Now this node is called, this is called a, an inject node, and what it allows you to do is set a, a payload, a specific payload, and then you inject it when you press the, manually when you press the button on the left, and people use it for testing. So let me set the payload to be a string of hello world. Uh, and then this node, if you click on it, you get a little help panel on the right-hand side. This is called a debug node, and any messages that flow along the wire into it, basically it just drops out into the console. So it's a bit like a, a print log node. So we, when you're finished wiring together your different devices and nodes and services, you click deploy. It deploys it to the runtime, and then I can manually trigger off uh, the messages from the inject node flowing along the wire, which get dropped out to the console. So not, not very interesting, but you can start to get an idea of, of how you actually use a visual editor. So let's just finish this Hello World example off by adding in some, some JavaScript, which we're, we're here all to learn about today. So for example, we have, I think the best node is called a function node, which I can drop onto the wire like that. And then I can open up the editor panel. And what you can do is you can basically write some, some JavaScript in here that gets executed dynamically every time a message comes in. And the message is available in the environment as a global variable called uh, msg. So if I wanted to, let's just reverse the string uh, of the message and then return it and then dump it to the console. So msg is the, is the variable with the, the message in. It has an attribute called payload. So I'm just going to overwrite it. Uh, now, in JavaScript, the best way to reverse, a, the only way to reverse a string is to split into an array. You have to reverse the array, and then you have to join the array, because JavaScript's a wonderful language. Uh, so I do that, I click deploy, and then now I should be able to, there we go, inject my messages, code gets executed, and it drops to the console. So you can see how, using the function node, I can start to kind of add in little bits of, of kind of business logic. So um, let's kind of go one step further, right, and try and play with uh, trying to play with some of these devices. So I've got the. Let's start with the Blink one, and say I want to interact with it in Node Red. Well, I need uh, I need a widget to be able to. I need a, a node to be able to do that. And as I said, you can you can write them yourself, and it's really easy to do. It's just JavaScript and HTML, and you install it into the editor. But because Node-RED has this huge open source community, I can actually just go and use other people's nodes. So if you go to the website flows.node-red.org, this is the library where people publish the solutions they've created and also the different nodes for you to be able to kind of install and talk to different devices. So for example, you know, if you've got a Tesla car, there is actually a node for interacting with your Tesla car if you install, things like that. Um, but I have, uh, I have a Tesla car, but I've got the Blink one. Uh, and I can see that actually someone has kindly already published a node. You can install them using NPM, so it's really easy to get them installed. Uh, and it's going to give me a node like that in the editor, which I can then interact over the USB port with my Blinken. Uh, let's check. There's also one for the sensor tag. Sensor tag. Uh, where is it? Uh, get rid of the flows. So here is the node red for the sensor tag. So again, this is going to be an input node. So it's going to listen to sensor data over Bluetooth and then push it into node red uh, as messages into the flow. So actually, I've already installed both of those. So I have the Blinkum here, like that. 
I can drag on, and then I'm going to copy some nodes I pre-prepared to save me some time. And I'm going to wire them up. So this is just is three inject nodes, and all they have is they have the payload of a particular color. Right, so blue, green, and red is the, is the contents of the message. And if I click on the blink one and I look at the info panel, it says that I can send it an RGB color message or I can just give it one of the, the particular color names. So if I click deploy and then I click blue, there we go, right? I click green and then I click red, right? Now, really, really quickly, I've got a nice little way to interface with my device that I've just bought using someone else's node, right? So I've got a really, really quickly you know, without knowing any of the details, I've got a really simple way to kind of interact with this device that I've just got hold of. So let's try the same thing uh, with uh, the sensor tag. Uh, again, I can uh, install a node, sensor tag, uh, and we're going to connect it to a debug node because I just want to see what data is coming out. Uh, I'm going to change it to drop, or I want to just debug the whole message, not just the payload. I wire it together. No, and let me turn it on because it just go off after a while. I click deploy. So again, so the sensor tag uh, again, both in, we're trying to auto discover any any nodes in the local area uh, over Bluetooth um, that it can connect to unless you specify a particular uh, a particular unit. And these are all the sensors that you've got available. And you can choose to just listen to a couple of them. So according to uh, if you look at the little status monitor, it says it's connected. It takes about a couple of seconds for the data to come through. So if I start waving it around, there we go, right? Here's all the data that's coming off the sensor tag. Things like it's got buttons on as well. It's got accelerometers, pressure, humidity. Uh, so I can really, really easily now get data out of my sensor tag and kind of play around and do something cool. So the next thing to do, obviously, is, uh, is to wire my devices together. So maybe I'd like it. So it's got some buttons on the side. It's got a left and right button. And uh, maybe when I press the button, I want to change the color of the LED automatically. Um, so I can't wire the devices in Node Red straight directly together because the message formats are slightly different. So I need some JavaScript to kind of transpose the messages to make it, is make it going to work. So to do this, right, I'm going to use my, I'm going to use a function node that I've prepared. So I grab that. I'm going to put it, uh, put it there. I'm going to wire my sensor tag to a function. I'm going to wire a function to the LED. I click deploy while and leave it to connect. Uh, and essentially that function node, if I make this a little bit bigger, again just looks to see if the if the message, incoming message from the sensor tag has the left or right property true, which is the button left or right. And it just chooses a random color uh, from the array that's been listed. So hopefully, right, so it's connected. If I wait for the data to start to come through, I should be able to start to press the buttons. And it should, there we go, right? So you can see now, as I'm pressing the buttons left and right, I've wired the, my two devices together, and now I can choose almost any color from an RGB LED. So that was, that was pretty easy, right? We've got two random devices, I connected them up, I connected them together. Um, what might you, what you might like to do now? Well, with kind of IoT development, um, often what you want to do is, is get your devices and expose them and integrate them with other applications, right? That might not be running in Node-RED. So one of the things you want to be able to do is give, create little APIs to interact with your devices. And Node-RED makes this very easy because it has uh, HTTP nodes. So it has a HTTP input node where you can define an endpoint and then when a request comes in, it sends a message into the flow and it has a response node to say what obviously the response should be uh, and then you can kind of use some JavaScript to define what happens in that. So if we wanted to create an API so that I could talk to my, uh, my LED over a REST API request, uh, we can do that. So let me copy these nodes and drop them in here. I'm going to wire that up to there. Uh, so this is a, it's a HTTP input node, right? It defines the operation and the endpoint that I want to be able to talk to. Uh, it's got a little bit of code, a little bit of JavaScript, which basically looks for a query parameter, color, and sets that to the payload of the message. Uh, and then that message goes both to the, the, the LED, and then it sends uh, back the response of the HTTP request as just a 200 to anything. So now if I click deploy, I should be able to go to localhost. Uh, and say green or you know red or blue, right? Any color that you want. 
And now I've created a HTTP endpoint to talk to my device using Node-RED. So I could then integrate that, you know, if I can run Node-RED in the cloud, and I can integrate that with pretty much with any application call. So to finish off, let's look at kind of bringing in some kind of internet-based services. Node-RED has nodes for, for interacting with all kinds of, of internet-based APIs, things like Slack and Twilio and Twitter. Uh, and everyone these days seems to want to connect all the devices up to things like Twitter. So for example, if we wanted to, maybe we want to put my uh, sensor tag on Twitter so it's tweeting out whenever there's new sensor data coming in. Again, I can do that using the nodes in the palette for the Twitter service. So uh, you can see that there's two nodes for Twitter in Node-RED. One is an input node, so that it will, you can basically configure it for an account, and then whenever messages occur on a hashtag or a topic, it publishes them into the flow automatically, and you can you know, take events, send commands based on that. And then there's an output node, which allows you to send messages from the flow, and it's going to send a, a tweet to the account that you've authenticated with. So for example, if I grab uh, this node and this node, and drop them on here. I'm going to wire my sensor tag up to the function. So the function's going to run. Uh, and basically, all it's going to do is, again, if you press the left or right button, it's going to create a new message, which is that kind of the button press and the timestamp. I click deploy. Uh, and then this is a Twitter output node. And you can see I've already configured it with the authentication credentials for a particular Twitter account that I'm using for this demo. So once I wait for the sensor tag to connect, Let's turn it on again. There we go, discovering. Connected, and we'll wave it around a bit. And then I'll start to press the buttons. There we go, right, so some data's coming through. So now if I start pressing the buttons, you should see the Twitter node say it's tweeting out. And there, it sounds like it's changing. So if I go to the, the account, right, oh, JT demo, you can go and say hello. Uh, then you can see, right, six seconds ago, seven seconds ago, seven seconds ago, there's my, my butter button tweeting out whenever I, uh, whenever I kind of interact with it. So now I'll know if someone's playing with my button just by following the Twitter account. So using some of the, the, the kind of social nodes, you can really easily connect your devices to things like Twitter and Slack and Twilio and other kind of nodes to make them really easy to integrate with all the kind of REST-based APIs and services. So let's go back to the, the kind of slides now and kind of think about some other kind of scenarios of doing IT development. Uh, you can see why, why I think Node-RED is such a, such a powerful tool, right? It allows you to really, really quickly kind of um, get started with IoT development, right? You can experiment really quickly with loads of devices without having to know the underlying integration and, and integration points for all of those APIs. It makes it easy to experiment. You can also share your solutions really easily. You can actually export the flow as a JSON document and share it online and then go and pull down other people's. But in the scenario we've just talked about, right? Often you want to talk to devices that are kind of at the edge of the network, right? Not physically located in the same room as you. So how do we think about connecting to you know, remote devices? Again, devices which aren't located in the same location as Node-RED. But also think about scaling, right? If I want to talk to you know, thousands of these sensor tags, you know, I can't do that on a single machine. So how can I scale to talk to lots of IoT devices? I need a, a very kind of lightweight and flexible way to do this. It's going to suit IoT kind of scenarios, right? Low power, low bandwidth, edge of the network. Well, generally, in, kind of IO, in the IoT world, the de facto standard for doing this is a protocol called MQTT. It's an open protocol that is designed for connecting edge of network devices together. It's very, very lightweight, and it's designed for these low power, low bandwidth scenarios. So it's kind of IT, ideal for doing kind of IoT, uh, and especially suited for devices that are not in the kind of same room as you. So at a very high level, uh, MQTT provides you with a very uh, lightweight uh, publish subscribe messaging semantics on top of a kind of underlying TCP connection. So you have uh, an MQTT broker, which is a kind of centralized broker, which all of your clients connect to. Clients can be devices, it can also be Node-RED, uh, and they have a, a lightweight TCP connection to that broker. And then the protocol gives them some kind of pub sub semantics up top. So you can, clients can publish messages to topics, and then the subscribers get notified by the broker as they occur. And MQTT is a, it's an open standard, so you can go, if you're really bored, you can go to Oasis and read the standard. 
but you know that any client or broker that's been implemented is going to be compatible with any other client or broker that's implemented and followed the same version of the standard. Now, in terms of brokers, there's lots and lots out there. There's some really big, popular ones uh, that are open source on GitHub. Uh, things like uh, Mosquito and Moscow are some of the biggest standalone MQTT products that you can pull down and run, and they're really, 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 really popular. If you already use messaging products at work, maybe you use things like ActiveMQ, like RabbitMQ, uh, actually you can download plugins for the MQTT protocol for these products so just to extend your existing messaging infrastructure, which is pretty cool. Um, there's lots of commercial offerings as well. Um, IBM has an appliance called Message Site for doing very high throughput MQTT messages, kind of millions of messages a second you can plug into a data center. But these days, I think everything, everything is moving to the cloud, right? Everything is software as a service, and it's no different for, for MQTT brokers. So if you, whoever your cloud provider is, right, whether you're with I don't know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, right, if you are using their cloud services and cloud platform, they will definitely have some kind of IoT service that you can provision. And within the IoT service will generally be an MQTT, a hosted, you know, cloud scalable MQTT broker. All of the big cloud providers have kind of standardized on MQTT as the protocol for getting data from devices into their cloud platforms. So if you go and provision their IoT service, it generally comes with some kind of MQTT server for you to be able to connect to without having to be able to set anything up. Um, it's the same for clients. So all the major languages, and most minor ones these days, have a big open source client for the MQTT library. Uh, Node.js is no different. There's one on NPM called MQTT. Uh, but Java, Go, Ruby, you know, whatever you want to use, they definitely have an MQTT client for connecting to. And because IoT often runs on kind of specialized environments, there's things like there's an embedded C driver, someone's written one for the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, um, so they're really, really easy to get hold of. So if you wanted to use MQTT as the kind of protocol to connect remote devices into Node-RED, let's have a look at how you would do this. I want to take a little bit of the demo we just did locally and then run it on the internet to talk to devices which are not located in the same you know, kind of physical space as Node-RED. So you can imagine in Node-RED, it actually has two nodes for MQTT built in. It's got, a, it's got an input node so that you can, uh, you can basically wait for, you connect to a broker, wait for messages on a topic, and then publish those messages into the flow. And it also has an output node where you can send messages from the flow to a broker, to a topic, to your devices kind of out there on the internet. Uh, and what we're going to do to kind of modify our demo to run it kind of on the internet and the cloud rather than my laptop is that use these MQTT nodes rather than the raw device nodes. So previously, right, when I was just in the demo, we had this kind of this architecture, right? I had my devices talking to Node-RED locally through the device driver or something that's wrapped up in a JavaScript interface. But what we want to do is we want to put an MQTT broker in the middle. So the devices, using a bit of glue code in one of the client libraries, talk to MQTT. Node-RED talks to MQTT, and then they can exchange messages between them. Uh, and the advantage of doing this, right, is one, then the devices don't have to be in the same physical location as my, as my Node-RED instance. But then also I can scale really, really easily. Like I can send a message to a topic to talk to hundreds or thousands of these different LEDs, and vice versa, I could be listening to sensor data from hundreds or thousands of these different sensor tags. So let's have a look at just a, a quick demo of taking a little bit of the, what we just did and kind of running it on the internet and showing you how that worked using our kind of MQTT as the protocol. So let me mirror my screen again. And check that now. Is there no red still running? Let me get rid of all of this. So, I'll just kill no red. I'll make this a bit bigger. So obviously, uh, to, to do this, right, to run Node-RED kind of remotely, I need a couple of things if we're going to use MQTT with Node-RED. You need, obviously, somewhere to run your Node-RED instance in the cloud, in this example, because that's where everyone puts everything. I also need an MQTT broker to be able to play with, because that's, uh, that's going to act as our interface between the devices and Node-RED. Uh, and then I, I can kind of play around with integrating that. So today I'm going to be using, um, I'm going to be hosting my Node-RED instance in IBM's cloud called Bluemix because we can, you can provision a kind of boilerplate app on Cloud Foundry, the platform as a service, really, really quickly. Um, so using the boilerplate, you can come in and, and kind of provision your own Node-RED instance. So I'm going to run that 
in the cloud. Uh, and then we're also going to use our IoT service because it gives you a hosted MQTT service you can play with, and it gives you all the analytics and that kind of stuff on top. But MQTT is an open protocol. You can use whatever broker, whatever cloud provider you particularly like to use. So to save me, you watching me actually deploy out of random application to the cloud, uh, I've already done this. So I've got a remote instance of Node-RED running on IBM's cloud at this URL. But if I go to, uh, you can see so this is running externally, right? This is running somewhere in the cloud. I don't control it. So I'm going to have no way to physically talk to my devices. And so I'm going to need MQTT to do that using a bit of bridging code. Uh, and again, uh, one of the things is that if you're using MQTT over the internet, Right, you need to think about you need to think about security, right? If I've got a public accessible MQTT broker, how do I stop people coming into my, you know, talking to my devices and kind of interacting with them? So if you are provisioning one of these cloud IoT services on one of your IoT providers, they generally will allow you to register. You have to register your devices, and then they give you certificates and usernames and passwords to be able to connect to the client library to make sure that everything is secure and encrypted. So again, I've already set up my IoT service on IBM's cloud, and I've gone and I've registered my different devices. So I've registered my Blink one and my sensor tag, and I've downloaded the certificates locally, uh, and now I want to actually get them connected to the broker using one of those MQTT client libraries. So I have, I've got a tiny bit of code that I've written locally. Um, let's, do, let's do that. Um, so the first bit of code basically just uses the JavaScript MQTT library and the, the NPM module for the the, uh, the Blink One bridge. And essentially what this is going to do is going to listen to messages on a topic with a color, and it's going to push them to the device. And it says it's connected to, the, connected to the broker. And then I have another bit of bridging code that's going to run on my, you know, my device for the sensor tag. And essentially what this is going to do, make that a little bit bigger, uh, is basically just listen for sensor data over Bluetooth and then publish it to an MQTT topic. So really, so using MQTT, I, I've written a bit of bridging code with the Node.js client library for the protocol to, to it connect my devices to the broker. So now I can go into Node-RED, which is running you know, in the cloud and is not physically going to talk to my devices and connect them up over MQTT. Cool. So it says they're online now, right? So they're both online. They've been publishing data, which is good to see. So if I go into my, this is my Node-RED instance running in the cloud, and it has got a password on it, so you won't be able to get access to it. Um, and you'll notice I've got these two uh, device nodes here. Now, the, I'm not using the raw MQTT nodes. What I'm using is the, 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 called the IoT, the Watson IoT platform nodes that basically wrap MQTT under the covers because it handles all the authentication out of the box. So rather than you having to watch me set them up, I've just gone and configured it to talk to the devices that we are connected to. So they're both connected. Um, but under the covers, all it's doing is using MQTT. So you could, under, actually, with a bit of work, use the raw ones, but it's just easier to use the ones that come with the platform. So again, this what I want to do is wire my devices together. So I want to wire the, uh, the messages coming from the sensor tag to my function, which is just the same function as before. Just chooses like a random color whenever the buttons are pressed. Uh, and then if I wire that to there and click Deploy, now, Again, if I start to press the button, there we go, right? You can see. As I'm pressing the button, the LED's changing. But think about what's happening within you know, the blink of an eye, right? Uh, I'm pressing the button, Bluetooth to my laptop. The laptop is publishing a message using the MQTT protocol up to the broker somewhere in the cloud. That's coming into Node-RED. You know, the message flows over the wire, runs my JavaScript, flows down back to the device, MQTT, the broker, back down to my laptop and then talking to my LED. So now you can think about it, I could really easily scale this solution, right? I could have, you know, I could have millions of these little LEDs all talking, all listening to the same topic and all being controlled by Node-RED. And I could also be listening to sensor data using from hundreds or thousands of these devices using MQTT as the protocol. So really, really quickly, you know, I can run Node-RED in the cloud and use MQTT to help me scale and talk to remote devices. So yeah, you can see how quickly, you know, MQTT is a great solution for connecting to the remote devices and scaling uh, and makes it really, really easy to do. All the clients are open source, or there's loads of open source brokers, or if you're using a cloud provider, just go and provision their IT service and you generally get a hosted MQTT service to play with. So, uh, 
if we go back to the start of this talk, right, I said that I, I just, I'm a huge kind of JavaScript fanboy. I love to use it for everything, front end, back end, you know, mobile applications. I generally think that whatever the problem at work, JavaScript is somehow, is somehow the answer. And working in IBM's Emerging Technologies Division, uh, I also really think this IoT space is really interesting. The idea that we have all these mass-produced consumer products, they're now kind of intelligent and have loads of data and sensor tags and you can kind of play around with them. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to think about how can you kind of hack them together. But for many people who've bought some of these devices, whether it's things like an Echo Dot or Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, um, I think many of us are put off from kind of playing with it because you think that you need very low level hardware hacking skills to be able to do it. It's all, you know, embedded C and hexadecimal over a serial port and that kind of stuff. But I didn't want to use any, you know, I'm very dangerous with the soldering iron and I don't know embedded C and I just want to use JavaScript for everything. Um, so I was really pleased to discover there's this wonderful open source tool called Node-RED that makes this really, really easy to do. You get a nice little visual editor where you can wire devices together. You can write little bits of JavaScript to code up your applications. And it really makes kind of building IT solutions really, really easy to do. So we looked at taking some random devices, using Node-RED, connecting them together, connecting them to the internet, and kind of building up our solutions. And then finally, we talked about how to kind of scale your solution, right? Using MQTT in the cloud, now I can talk to hundreds of thousands of devices, and they don't have to be in the same physical location as me. So hopefully, you know, using Node-RED and a bit of JavaScript, maybe MQTT, uh, you know, I've shown you all the skills to go away and build your own internet of JavaScript-enabled things. So thank you very much for listening. I think we've got sort of 10 minutes of questions. If not, I'll be around all day. Or if you need help with Node-RED and that kind of stuff, you can always find me on Twitter afterwards, and I can kind of help you out. So thank you very much.